All right, well, we can go ahead and get started. And we'll start with introductions. So I'm going to have each of the panelists share their name and their organization. And if you could give a brief introduction about your role in your organization. Natalie, we'll start with you. Uh, hello, all. I'm Natalie Crary. I work for Amate House in Chicago. Um, so these are all year of service programs. Amate House gets 20 fellows a year. Um, and we work with a really broad diversity of different placement sites from legal clinics to medical clinics, schools and social work centers. Um, so one of our big emphasis is, uh, is on placing you somewhere where you'll get that professional development. Um, and then the last uh, aspect of our program is doing faith and social justice, um, education and leadership development. Uh, for the program, I am the recruiter. I also am one of the program coordinators, so I have a very fellow-facing role, um, working with them at their sites and making sure things are going smoothly and leading retreats. Um, and in the past, uh, about a decade ago, I was a fellow with the program, so I've got so those sorts of, of different experiences. It's great to be here. See you all. Uh, I'm Megan Roop. I'm with uh, Dominican Volunteers. Um, I, like Natalie, uh, almost a decade ago, I was also a Dominican volunteer. Uh, similarly to Amate House, Dominican Volunteers places uh, individuals in full-time service working in education, social service, healthcare, advocacy, many different, many different opportunities. We are throughout the U.S. Um, we place anywhere from 15, 20 is really our cap volunteers each year um and i i am the executive director i'm also on a staff of two my colleague is on the call so uh similarly to natalie i also have a, a, a very in very good touch with our volunteers uh, as we are a small staff so uh i'm gonna pass it over to my colleague so she can introduce herself as well hi everyone um uh, my name is stephanie savala like megan said i um am colleague at Dominican Volunteers USA. I'm the program director. Um, so a lot like Natalie was mentioning, I am in charge of um, placing volunteers, making that initial contact with volunteers, recruiting them, uh, making sure all is good, as well as managing social media, Instagram, and things like that. Um, and then just to tell you a little bit more about Dominican Volunteers, we are guided by the Dominican spirit. That's what makes us unique. And also what makes us unique is that um, in a lot of programs, you're um, living in community, but with, with your peers, but with us, you are living with um, vowed religious sisters who um, a lot of the time, most of the time will serve as guidance and will serve as a resource for you as you transition out of school and into ministry work. So we really, really, um, rely heavily on that relationship with the sisters in our program to be guided, uh, guided by the Dominican spirit. So something, something unique about us. I'll go next here. Um, my name is Lisa Murphy and I'm with the St. Joseph Worker program. Um, I'm out of St. Paul, Minnesota and I am the co-director here. So um, leadership administration also working with our volunteers. Um, but we are not just in St. Paul. We are also in uh, Los Angeles and Orange, California, as well as in Queens, New York. And there are staff members uh, and directors in each of those locations. So there's staff with uh, our volunteers in all of those locations. So you always have that support system. Uh, our volunteers work in advocacy, education, um, direct service, as well as healthcare. Uh, one of the things that uh, we build our program around uh, is leadership and uh, leadership development, both personal and professional, justice, obviously social justice, a big component of any kind of service here, um, spirituality, as well as community. And I think one of the big things that makes our program unique is that we are a program for women. Uh, so that is uh, part of our focus um, is supporting women as they grow and develop, and that, that is uh, one, one key piece of what we do. Thanks. Hello, my name's John Barron. I'm with Christ the King Service Corps. We're Service Corps in Northwest Detroit, much like, I guess, the Chicago folks or the Monte House, but we basically focus on a neighborhood in Northwest Detroit. We have a, a parish-based organization. 
Um, so when it comes to like spiritual support or community support, sometimes it comes from me being the um, program director, but with from Father Core. And then also we have a very large parish and some of them just kind of adopt um, our volunteers as the living community. It's a community house, a former rectory that became a convent that's basically right across the street from the school where we have volunteers place, but also we focus on um, a food pantry soup kitchen um, that's down the road from our campus. And then we have a, like a sister parish that has a community center. So most of our placements are basically neighborhood based. We kind of focus on um, our volunteers kind of living in and becoming part of the community um, and our neighborhood. We do some citywide placements um, for a lot of uh, homeless or sheltered groups work in our neighborhood and so some of those places are downtown but mostly the focus is in our neighborhood and our parish in northwest Detroit. My name is Carlos Romatiste. I represent the Peace Corps. Um, Peace Corps is an opportunity to live and work overseas. Uh, we have six categories of service, education, public health, youth development, agriculture, environment, and community and economic development. Um, our program is a 27 months of service uh, that is preceded by three months, well, excuse me, it's 24 months of service preceded by three months of training. All of that happens in your country of service. So it is 27 month commitment. Um, as I said, we are all over the world um, and we are looking, we have at any given time 7,000 volunteers. So in a typical year, we're looking to fill around 3,500 positions. Um, this year is going to be a little bit different, hashtag COVID-19, right, for all of us. So, um, yeah, we're probably going to be looking for a few more volunteers than we normally are, so this is a great time to be looking at Peace Corps and really, honestly, any of our service opportunities that we're going to talk about today. Thank you all for joining us and for introducing yourselves. We did get a question in the chat box already. What are some actions I can take in college to prepare for a service job after graduation? So whether those are specific activities or steps to take, um, your insight would be appreciated. I would say one of the things that, at least speaking from my experience, that sort of helped me dive into that full year of service was um, being involved in the ministry center of my school, if that's something that you have. Um, that'll be like sort of like a small introduction to the ways in which we um, use like the gospel and things like that right in our service and how we mix all of that but also um, I would say getting involved with um, shorter um, service trips so like my school I graduated from Dominican um, University um, but we had shorter week-long service trips to New Orleans or um, you know different placements um, and those really helped me sort of um, like start get me get me to start thinking about service what that was what that meant how it was that I was an ally to the communities that I was coming into and so I think that by experiencing shorter term um, service trips it sort of gives you a better idea if that's something that you want to do or that you have the capacity for the mind for the you know all of that it, it's, it'll be super helpful and we did something similar to what Stephanie was talking about we hosted a group of students on alternative spring break from Notre Dame during their winter break. It was a program called Urban Plunge and then also from U of M during their spring break. And the Notre Dame program is pretty comprehensive because they combine it with coursework and prep work on urban poverty. So there's ways, there's probably courses you can take in addition to, as what Stephanie was saying, just some short-term opportunities. Thanks, Stephanie and, and John, for promoting what we do in Campus Ministries Center for Social Concern. <laughs> I think Nick, I, I was going to tag you if you also, once the panelists go through, if you want to share your opportunities as well. I was, I was just going to add, I think another great way is to think about, depending on what your majors are, where do you do an internship? You know, and can you, can you do an internship in a community-based um, nonprofit that gets you connected to to issues you know in the Dayton community um, and then think about ways in which you can volunteer locally as well um, and really have time getting to know an issue that you are passionate about 
And I think that's going to help guide you if you want to do a service here. If you can identify an, an issue or a topic you are passionate about that you want to work on in a service year or, you know, Carlos can get you, hook you up for 27 months. So think about what you're passionate about and the work you want to do um, and, and finding a service program then that can help you do that post-grad too. But internships and community-based volunteering, in addition to those week-long service trips, are great ways to do it. The Peace Corps, honestly, we're looking for you to be getting some experience of what it is that you want to do. I think that, again, this is true for many of us across the board and also for professional opportunities, is get some, get some experience doing what you think you want to do. Um, and that's going to give you a step up. It's going to show all of us and show any other employers that you have some some skills and that you at least dipped your toes into the waters and, and are ready to take the next uh, step. So I find that for many students that I get a chance to talk to from, from Dayton, it's keep on doing what you're doing. Um, persevere and, and, and we'll be there to, to help you take the next step. I think also getting really honest with yourself about your privilege and your bias. Uh, you are, no matter what we do, we're going to carry our, our identities into every space we are. Uh, and I think working within marginalized communities, especially as white folks, we have to be incredibly aware of our privilege, our experience, and affirming that others have not always had things as easy as we have. So I think that's a, more of a personal thing, but I think pretty valuable. Nick, do you want to share a little bit about Center for Social Concern and what, how students can engage before they graduate? Oh, sure. Um, so we have, as you guys probably know this, we have all sorts of opportunities to get involved in, in service from service clubs to, you know, uh, one day things like uh, service Saturdays. Um, and then over, uh, over breaks, we do all kinds of great things um, from a local thing called The Real Dayton to, um, you know, uh, the trips that, that Stephanie was talking about. Um, in fact, we usually do one uh, at a Monte house. Um, we actually used to do one, John, before your time over at, uh, up in Detroit at Christ the King. Um, uh, and so lots and lots of opportunities, plus lots of international uh, trips as well over spring break. And then we have uh, a number of uh, summer long trips in, um, in, in summer <laughs> that are like, uh, six to eight weeks long and of course our summer Appalachia program which is a nine-week program in uh, Salyersville, Kentucky. So those are just a few of the things. Um, we also year-round have a number of things that are actually focused on post-grad volunteering. Uh, every October we have a, a fair and uh, typically get about 40-some um, different programs to uh, uh, to come visit us and have a, a, a table all in one place. And, um, and then in the, in the spring, we have a, a, a panel supper where uh, folks who have done a year or two of service will come and just talk about their experiences. Um, after uh, uh, after uh, the uh, baccalaureate mass, um, in, in May, we always do a special prayer service for those who are going off to volunteer and helps their parents to see that their kid's not the only crazy one. Uh, but it's also a great time to, you know, to be blessed and commissioned. Um, and I'm here, uh, you know, you're stuck with me, but, uh, but I'm here anytime you want to just chat and ask questions and get some information about, um, you know, what, what kind of uh, programs I might rec recommend based on what might be a good fit for you. I'll ask you 
a hundred different questions to try to figure that out, but yeah. So. Thanks, Nick. Before I move into my list of questions, are there any other questions for the student attendees that you'd like us to address at this point? Okay. I'll keep asking periodically and feel free to add them to the chat. We wanna make sure that we're answering the questions that you came with and that come up during this time. Um, so for the panelists, why should I pursue service? What benefits may I experience during and after a period of service? What a wonderful question um, that I like to answer a lot. Um, and I think my answer to this kind of goes into what, you know, why would, how can you prepare for a year of service? I know, you know, for a Mate house, when we think about like, what do our fellows get out of the year? Um, and what really does our leadership development look like? It's kind of the intersection of three things, right? It's like what you're passionate about. And we expose you to a lot of different things in the program. We particularly look at um, racism, poverty, and immigration are the big things we concentrate on. But having exposure to a lot of different things um, that you can be passionate about and then what you're good at. So like learning within community, what your role is, who you're living with, but also, you know, the job that you're at, what are you good at? What do you wanna continue pursuing? And then the third axis of things, which is kind of like, what are the needs in the world? And so I think a lot of these years act to say, you've, you've gone to a great school. Dayton has so many awesome resources. A lot of those people are sitting on this call today. Um, but you might not have done a ton of reflecting on those three areas. And so, you know, we really want you to come out of a year of service with an idea of kind of where you're located as far as those three things go, um, as well as having had an experience of living somewhere, um, you know, as diverse and um, interesting and complicated as Chicago. So there are like a thousand different takeaways you can get from a year of service, um, but the big one that our program really focuses on, um, and I think that a lot of these programs do, is that deeper understanding of like, what is the mission um, that I wanna continue on serving in my life? And, what's a, and how can I fit into a community and find a group of people who are doing that with me um, as well, whether that's you know people I'm living with, my friends, my family, a faith community, or even a work community. Um, and so having that kind of self-assurance of knowing this is what I want to do uh, with my life and continue on. I think the only thing I want to add to what Natalie was saying, I mean, certainly there's the opportunity to live in community and get to know other people, but in Detroit, much like Chicago, is that whole notion of diverse and complicated. Um, I've worked as a city planner for about 20 years before working for the service board. Um, and as much like we get healthcare practitioners that want to volunteer, you know, for a doctor, it's good to have a big side man and you get one direct service. But also in careers as diverse as architecture or planning, you can't plan a city or design a building for a community if you really don't understand the type of people that live in that community. So I think no matter what, just a direct, direct service, the encounter with other diverse people, that's going to like build your suite of skills when it comes to almost any job where you deal with people. So I think that's one of the other big benefits I think you get from a year of service, especially if you got opportunity to work in, you know, a diverse and complicated environment. Two of the big things that we talk about at Dominican Volunteers is um, networking and, um, <clears throat> well, let me start with networking. I think, that's something that's really important right nowadays so you graduate and you um think that you want to go into a job and oftentimes you need to know somebody to get into that job it just seems like that's just been the case at least in my experience and so with with having so many different placements and all around the country you get the chance to network and meet people and create relationships with it which i think is also a big part of um, networking, right? Like building genuine intentional relationships. And that's something that for me was really like a huge benefit. I came out of there, out of my year with um, friendships, lifelong friendships, not only with the people that I was in community with, but also with the people that I served with. Um, and so that's, that was just really, um, that's been very, very important to me. 
Um, and then the other thing that we talk about is that um, oftentimes maybe you graduate with a major and you still don't know what you want to do by, by doing a year of service. It, and I think some of you have alluded to that, right? It confirms um, what you want to do or what you don't want to do, right? Like me, some of our volunteers have had an art background and then go into teaching um, and then they become teachers or they become social workers. And that's just because that they found that passion. Um, and there's a way to integrate their bachelor's and their, you know, university experience, undergraduate career with the social work with, um, it's more giving, I think, part of what we do. So, um, yeah, those are the two big things that we talk about at Dominican Volunteers. I, I would say yes to both what Natalie said, uh, as well as the networking piece that Stephanie was talking about. Those are definitely components of our program uh, as well. And in our program, we really also try to help women develop, in particular, their leadership skills, um, in that women's leadership can often look different uh, from men's. Um, but to grow in those skills and to, and to trust that strength that you have as a leader that may look different than the way in which somebody else leads. So I think that is a, a component for us. Um, we are also one of the faith-based programs, uh, and this is more about a tangible benefit than a per personal and professional growth benefit, um, but a tangible benefit for us is we are also an AmeriCorps affiliated program. Um, so many of our placement sites are also eligible for an AmeriCorps award at the end of the service year. So uh, I, I think for some people that is, um, that is a concern or a consideration when they look at a service year and just know that there are faith-based programs out there that are AmeriCorps affiliates and, and we are one of them. So can you explain uh, what that means and how much it is? And Sure. So an AmeriCorps, you know, as you know, if you've heard of AmeriCorps, it is um, where you, in our program, you receive the education award. So it is a $6,000 award at the end of the service year that you can use to pay back existing loans that you have already. You can also use it um, if you are one of those fortunate folks who don't have a lot of student debt coming out of undergrad. You can also use it to pay future educational expenses. So, as I said, the award is about $6,000 this year. I have not yet heard what it's going to be for next year, but it'll be pretty close to that. Um, so I think that's a, a, a tangible benefit. You know, so if you're looking to say to your parents, I will get something out of this, and you can talk about those intangibles of personal and professional development, skills, and experience, you can also say, there's some money in this to help me pay for school. Um, and I do know that with, with our current state, with COVID-19, there is really a push to expand the AmeriCorps program. Um, and there is some, are some legislators who are looking at really ramping up AmeriCorps as a way to um, help deal with the economic and healthcare pieces that will be long-term with COVID-19. So I think it's, a, I think it's a, a piece that people should consider. I don't think it's the only thing. Um, I think there's a lot of value in a service here, even if you don't get an AmeriCorps award for it. Um, there's a lot of value that you're going to get out of a service year. But Nick, does that answer your question? If I could re-emphasize what everyone said, I think context and community really is, is really large about what you get out of doing something like a service year. Context for who you are, context for where you are, context for where you've been and where you want to go. I think that the communities that you get a chance to engage with, both the, both the communities that you serve, the communities that you serve with, and those communities that support you while you're serving are all communities that you take with you throughout your life. Um, and those community members will be a part of that network, like Stephanie said, that will help pull you up um, and help pull you into new opportunities as you graduate and move on um, from where you are. Um, let's talk a little bit about the, 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 the uh, tangible benefits from doing something like Peace Corps, sorry about that, um, is that 
we're a little bit different. We're a federal program as well. We're a little bit different from AmeriCorps. We don't have that educational award at the end. We have um, just a straight dollar amount. Right now it's pegged at around uh, $10,000 and it's taxable. So it's a little bit less that you can use to do anything that you want with. Um, in terms of education, we have partnerships called Coverdell Fellowships, um, where universities are actively recruiting return Peace Corps volunteers and bringing them in, into their programs. Um, and so they will offer you a minimum of 25% paid up to a full ride. I, for one, I got my urban planning graduate degree at the University of Cincinnati as a Coverdell. Um, so it is, it's a great opportunity. You also have something called non-competitive eligibility. You also get that through AmeriCorps, which is a hiring authority to get into the federal government. Um, I know a lot of times when I, when I mention, have you ever thought about working in the federal government, people never think about it, but there's not a job that is in the world that doesn't exist in the federal government. So having, a, having that opportunity um, is a really powerful one and it's a great opportunity to take your career to the next level. Um, and so those, those are some of the, the, the tangible benefits that are a little bit different from Peace Corps. And for all of us, there's gonna be some, a few different tangible benefits during and after your service. Um, but again, I think that, that the, the year of service gives you the clarity that we talked about that's really important as you develop your career. And that's probably the biggest benefit that you get out of it, bar none. I also want to add, if it wasn't said already, some universities also give tuition discounts for having attended or for, for having done a year of service. So that's another um, sort of like tangible benefit as well. And grad school application waives waivers, so you can apply to more grad schools. Yeah, <clears throat> and grad schools are just, they love it when, and med schools and law schools, love it when you've put in a, a year of service, you got a year of experience under your belt, they're much happier to have um, a student with that kind of experience than someone who's just right out of grad school. And I think a, a lot of employers are, are in fact the same way, so. So we've talked a little bit about living in community and, and that's also a big topic on campus. That's it's one of the benefits that we see our students giving, um, getting. So can you speak a little bit more about what it means to live in community and what, if you use the term intentional community, what that specifically means and then for faith-based service communities speaking from that lens as well. I'll start off real quick. I think Peace Corps is going to be a, a unique one. For us, we live in, in different countries. And so we are in communities. We live at the community level and we live as individuals in our community. Um, and what that means and I, I, is, is strictly that like you are engaging people around you and you're engaging them in their local language and you're in, in, engaging them in their local community and their cultures. Um, and so it is not something where you don't see other volunteers or don't have engagement with your Peace Corps community at large. But again, what we are really focused on is individually becoming a part of this community of others, right? And really becoming one with them. Um, so that's Peace Corps, which again, is gonna be unique, I think, in this, in this uh, field. And at Christ the King, we kind of describe it almost like three levels of community. You have the house that you live in community with the other volunteers, um, and that's just mostly, you know, sharing responsibilities. And we're not really associated with any particular religious order. So when it comes to this spiritual growth, we usually spend a lot of time at the beginning of the community with the house members determining what that is. And so there's the community in the house, but then we have the community of the parish. We're parish-based, so mass is right across the parking lot at, at our at Christ the King Church. And we have a lot of the uh, parishioners are actually on our board and they provide service to the folks. I think sometimes they'll get invited to dinner with parishioners or taking on outings or cottages with them. They'll travel with them. And then we have the whole, the neighborhood aspect. Of it. Once again, by being parish based and doing our placements in the neighborhood, you know, they get to know their neighbors really well. People across the street, 
but also the folks that live in the other side of the neighborhood and then come to our community center or our food pantry. So yeah, what, community at Christ the King, it's like three different levels. And then also what we do is we kind of introduce our volunteers to, we have a Mercy Volunteer Corps, a Jesuit Volunteer Corps in Detroit. We also have gatherings with a Jewish and a Methodist Volunteer Corps. Volunteer Corps. So we kind of, it's, we live in community, at least at Christ the King, it's, it's a lot of different levels. I would say too that for the St. Joseph workers, there's a, those levels of community as well. You've got your house community, the people that you're experiencing this service here with who are there as your support system and sometimes they're your challenge and as, you know, sometimes they're your soft place to land. Um, you know, so there's that immediate level of community uh, in all of our locations. All of our houses are in neighborhoods, so you have that neighborhood level of community as well. Um, for Minneapolis, St. Paul, you're in, um, in, a, in a neighborhood that includes Latinx immigrants, uh, Native American, as well as East African immigrants. So you've got this great diversity around you um, and a thriving uh, neighborhood. Um, we are sponsored by the Sisters of St. Joseph, so that's another level of community that you get um, with the sisters. And then also there's a, we always say once a St. Joseph worker, always a St. Joseph worker. So there is that St. Joseph worker community as well. Um, and in the Twin Cities, we've had over 160 women do this program. And, you know, a lot of times they are more than willing to reach back and help the current group. So whether that's doing one-on-ones, that networking that Stephanie was talking about, that support system, um, the wisdom figures, um, as well as professional networking. So there's, um, there's a lot of levels. And because we're also in these four different cities, we also have people around the country that you can connect to, uh, whether it's the, the Sisters of St. Joseph community or the St. Joseph worker community, that even beyond your service year, you've got connections in a lot of different places. So we've got a lot of levels of community, just like John was saying too. And it's a great support system. Okay, something that I always tell my applicants and fellows. Um, so we have uh, 20 fellows, they live in 10 person communities. That's a lot. Intentional community, I find so hard to describe because it's like you are committing to being friends with these people who you're not choosing to live with. And the big one is to do conflict resolution. So like we talk about like here's nonviolent conflict resolution, here's some particular tools. Um, and our groups are pretty diverse. Like we get a bunch of kids from like the West Coast and the East Coast, from the Midwest and from the South. Obviously those are all within the US, but um, so like just that geographical diversity as well as um, you know racial diversity um, and income background diversity makes for a ton of different conflict styles and every year there are some east coasters who are very direct and the midwesterners uh who are indirect and we got to figure out how are we going to learn that um and so when this time of year comes and our fellows are kind of looking at what am i going to do next what are my jobs um that i'm applying for that is a huge soft skill that is great to be able to bring in to interviews and to the workplace, as well as to have for yourself is to know what, like, how can I resolve conflict with a variety of different people? Um, I bring that up just because I think that's a really tangible thing to take away. Of course, the communities are also super fun to live in, um, as well as probably the most challenging part of the year. Um, for us, you know, 10 people is a lot. A lot of, I think, some other volunteer programs are like five-person houses, so it kind of, you know, doubles, like, the fun that you have, as well as possible stresses. Um, but as far as, like, tangible takeaways, I think having that conflict resolution experience in more than, like, in an intentional community is something that I bring up when I do professional interviews, for sure, and I know a lot of our fellows do as well. 
Yeah, I'm going to echo what Natalie said. Um, <clears throat> for us, community looks different. Sometimes it looks like living in an apartment um, with a sister. Sometimes it looks like a house with a pool. Other times it looks like a convent. Um, but in all of that, you are living with sisters. So our communities look different. Um, but I really wanted to talk about that part, the intentionality, the conflict resolution, that's huge for us, as well as accountability, I think is part of intentional community, right? And the reason why we talk a lot about intentionality and accountability is that for like we take a lot of examples from the social justice and liberation movements that we that we're also guided by so in when thinking about social justice you have to think about who are you holding accountable um right and so and i think for that is also for the benefit of the whole right i think oftentimes we were coming in from um into communities intentional communities from college we um sorry about the phone if you hear that <laughs> um but um sorry i lost my train of thought um yeah so we we leave college and we're sort of thinking about community and what's going to be best for me and how what what do i like right but i think when thinking about the bigger picture and thinking about social justice and that you're doing a year of service with the social justice lens you have to think about how do you hold yourself accountable and how do you hold others accountable how do you approach conflict because we value conflict very very highly in in dominican volunteers not that there's always conflicts but i think that that's going to be really important to take away um for like that bigger bigger mission of liberation um so that's something that we really really um value speaking of community um we haven't even had you guys introduce yourselves <laughs> so why don't we um, take a minute to do that, um, Matt and, and Michael, um, and we should have Jason and, and Liz introduce themselves as well. So, um, Matt, tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, what's your major, what year are you, um, and maybe you just graduated, I don't even remember, um, and, uh, and what interests you in post-grad volunteering? Uh, for sure. Um... I'm Matt. Nice to meet you all. Uh, I'm a I was a political science and uh, communications double major, but I recently graduated. Uh, with all this going on, it's kind of crazy. Still don't know if I'm officially graduated, but I hope I am. Um, uh, and I'm really interested in uh, the issues of poverty and education. I've worked with uh, Brother Ray Fitz at the University of Dayton in concentrated poverty uh, for about four years now, and I've had a great interest in this. But I actually want to go into law, so I can work with these issues more closely in that area. So I'm thinking of going to law school in the next year after this. So I wanted to have a year of service or a year in a career that has to do with something service related so that I could have that building up into law school. Thanks. Michael? Um, yeah, I'm Michael Kraska. Uh, I'm a rising sophomore, so still pretty early in the process, but I figure why not try and find my path? Um, I appreciate you guys coming out. I know it's not a very good turnout, but um, I'm just really interested in learning about different people, cultures, experiences, stuff like that. So thanks again. Jason, Liz. Hi, I'm Jason Eckert. I am the executive director of career services. So I work with, with Kelsey and Liz and I'm a campus colleague of Nick's. And I want to thank um, Matt and, and Michael for being with us this hour. And this is a rock star panel. So thanks to all of you for all of your advice and contributions during the hour. Hi, Matt and Michael. I'm Liz Seeger, Associate Director in Career Services, and I oversee our career advising functions. So we talk to students a lot about uh, career planning and plans after graduation. And um, uh, Matt in particular, but also Michael, um, you are a flyer for life. So you are able to use career services um, all the way through your work life until you retire. So Matt, as you're navigating law school and thinking about service and you need our help, let us know, make an appointment. We're working through Zoom. And Michael, as you're going through your discernment as well as a rising sophomore, definitely utilize our office. We'd love to talk to you about your planning and some of the things that you're thinking about. Thank you. Um, Matt and Michael, do you have any questions 
before I go back to my list. I have one for Lisa. Uh, so I've been uh, looking at a lot of AmeriCorps jobs on like different career websites. And I was wondering if they're all through one organization because I've been nervous about applying to one because if I don't get into that, I thought it might affect my chances at others. Is that how that works or is it something different? There are a lot of different AmeriCorps programs out there. So, um, and, and some of them have that AmeriCorps label and some like us have a different label, but we're an AmeriCorps affiliate. So that can be kind of the tricky one. Um, and that's where I think like um, Liz and Kelsey at the Career Center can help you look through some of those um, and kind of look for ones that will also help you with that goal that you want with law school and what you want to do as a lawyer too. The tricky part that you're going to have is one of the things that is not an AmeriCorps eligible service is advocacy and legislation. So, um, you know, keep that in mind, but that doesn't mean you can't get out there and find um, programs and service that teach you what it's like on the ground um, and then take that knowledge into law school and then say, here's the reality. What's the policy or law that will help solve that problem? So I think being, you know, kind of feet on the ground gives you great experience to take into law school. Um, and if you want, um, connect with me in the chat. One of our workers this year is going to law school after this year. So if you want to connect with her, I can certainly um, make that introduction if you want to talk to somebody who's doing service and then going to law school and thinking about how they're going to use this experience to impact their, their trajectory as a lawyer. So I can make that connection for you if you're also interested in that. Yes, definitely. Thank you. <laughs> sure. Matt, our office tracks the first destinations of all of our graduates, and in the average year, around 4% of graduating undergrads take part in one or more years of service after graduation. Um, in addition, I can say that when you add all of the AmeriCorps programs together, um, AmeriCorps has consistently been in the top 10 of all groups receiving Dayton Flyer grads. I think AmeriCorps may have been number six in terms of the groups that that hired or received the largest number of Dayton Flyers from the class of 2019. Um, I just had a question for Carlos. Um, I know you said something about like federal government jobs after service, um, but I kind of missed what you said. So do you mind repeating that? Yeah. There's a hiring authority that's called non-competitive eligibility, NCE. Uh, you also get that for completing some AmeriCorps programs, not all AmeriCorps programs. So AmeriCorps is, is huge. Um, and what that is, it is a one-year hiring authority into the federal government. So different federal agencies will be hiring on this not competitive authority, right? So looking for recent grads or folks who have recently been in service. Typically, those of us who have done that service here do have specialized skills that they're really looking for in different fields. Normally, you get non-competitive eligibility for one year after your service, um, if you get it. It's one consecutive year that can only be extended if you, say, go into grad school. Um, I think that's the only way that you can extend it. So, for example, if you did AmeriCorps and you took that that um, educational award went into a grad program, it pauses NCE while you're in graduate school. If you do Peace Corps, um, it, it pauses it if you go into grad school, meaning that if you finish and then you have three months and then you went into grad school, um, you'd have nine months left when after you graduated. Thank you. Absolutely. Matt, I want to just add a little uh, uh, part of the answer to uh, your question about uh, AmeriCorps. Um, one of the things is um, I, I completely doubt that you will have any problems getting into whatever, uh, whatever program you apply to. Um, but my understanding of the way that AmeriCorps works is that if you apply to one particular VISTA program, let's say you apply to the Dayton AmeriCorps. Do you know about the Dayton AmeriCorps that Carl 
SOARS runs? Yeah. Okay. So if you apply to that one and Carl says, nope, we don't want you, which he wouldn't, but um, uh, yeah, you could apply to any other one and it's not like you're blacklisted. Okay. okay yeah. if, that, if that was the question that you had. Yeah, yeah. I was just yeah. wondering just a little bit if that's... Plus you that have the good. University of Dayton on your uh, resume, so... Yeah. It, it, and let me add, um, Matt, from what Nick said. When you, when you use, when you become, when you join AmeriCorps, that gives you access to the postings. It's very similar to a traditional job search, which means, as Nick said, you apply to as many positions that interest you in terms of your interest areas, where you want to be geographically, and you're not blacklisted if you don't get called for one particular position. So, so really treat it like a job search and be as active as you can with the tool, okay? Okay, yeah. And I wanted to add something to that as you guys are going forward and thinking about applying for service years. Don't think about these as volunteer positions. Don't think about these as even really gap years. These are jobs. You're going to work, and it is not going to always be easy work. Um, and these are competitive opportunities as well. And so I want you, as you're going forward and as you're thinking about next steps, is apply. Put in solid applications to different programs and get to those interview phases because each of us and each, every organization and every position that you're gonna be applying for is a little bit different. And you wanna take that time to also interview us as, as potential opportunities. It's about how we fit with you and how you fit with us. So don't, all, don't ever just kind of lean in one direction and lean hard. Um, and to Michael, I would say, reach out to all of us, right? As again, as you're going through your career, we don't want to, this to be the only opportunity that we have to answer your questions. Um, we're all here. We most, you know, we're all alums of our programs, and we want to talk to you about our experiences and how our experiences really can fit into your longer-term career goals. Um, and sometimes you might not realize that you think, "Hey, I don't want to. I want to be a lawyer. What, what does health have to do with anything? Or what does education have to do with anything?" But all of these are opportunities that will build on your experience and build on your knowledge um, and you will take them. And I think there's nothing better than having cross-disciplinary experiences um, because it just makes you rounder in your next opportunity. So I just wanted to kind of build on where this conversation had been. And I think that's really important to think about as you are entering your careers. Building off that point, many of your programs have different types of positions or roles, different geographic locations. So how do your programs go about matching student interest areas with those roles and locations? What level of preference, um, student preference is considered in that process? Well, at, at Christ the King, I mean, the first stop is just straight up the job description and do you have any work experience or interest in it? But we, because they're a smaller program, we break it down even beyond that. I mean, so we have a volunteer this year that was interested in going to teaching and she had a theology and political science major. But basically we took two of our placements. One was doing, working at our food pantry soup kitchen. The other one was working at the school and just split up her time between them. So we kind of have an opportunity to work with um, the, the, the interest volunteer. I mean, we did the same thing at a community center. We have someone that wants to administer at the community center, but she also runs an entrepreneurship program for folks that want to do green infrastructure, solar panels and rain gardens. So our process is kind of multifaceted. I mean, we'll look at the qualifications for a specific position, but also if someone shows interest that isn't a direct match, we'll work with the folks. Uh, at Dominican Volunteers, it's a, it's a mutual discernment, uh, but preference of the volunteer is always, at any point, the volunteer can say, this doesn't feel like a good fit. There have been many occasions when a volunteer uh, comes into an interview with an idea of what they would like to do, and after getting to know them better, uh, <laughs> on my best day, on our best day, we can recognize some skills in them that might 
that might make them better suited for something else. So we will float that idea. Uh, and then again, it comes back to if that really seems like a good fit um, for the volunteer. So we have far more placements than we have volunteers every year. And that's so that we hopefully can provide a lot of diversity and a lot of opportunity to applicants. Uh, yeah, similar to Megan, we so we get 20 fellows a year. <clears throat> we usually have about 35 different positions um, from like a really broad variety of organizations. So as part of the interview process, we, you know, what are you interested in? What are you looking for? Um, you know, Matt hearing like, oh, I'm interested in going to law school. Great. We've got about 900 alumni. A bunch of them are lawyers now. Here's where they have worked. Here's the experience they've gotten out of it. Um, so then when we offer you acceptance, we'll send over like six or seven job descriptions and say, choose three of these to interview with, you know, great professional experience to do interviews. It also gives you a sense of kind of what the work at that site is like. Um, then we have our fellows or the applicants will like rank their preferences. We go back to that employer and say, Hey, you know, so-and-so really picked you as number one. Do you want to work with them? And usually the sites are like, yeah, absolutely. Great interview. We'd love to have them. Um, so that's how we do our placement process. Um, I think it's fairly similar to Dominican, maybe. <laughs> There's only so many ways, you know, and we're not picking out of a hat. I would say ours is very similar to both the Mate and Dominican volunteers in that you apply to the program you do an interview, you get accepted to the program, and then the next step is to interview at placement sites so that you, like Natalie saying, get the vibe, they get to know you, and it's a mutual yes of the placement site and the person. So in, in that way, like Amate and, and uh, like Dominican. I think one thing that makes us different is being a multi-site, um, multi-city uh, program, is we do have people who apply and they apply and say, I want to be either in New York or St. Paul. And they might interview at placement sites in New York as well as in St. Paul. And so we kind of work uh, with, our, with our cohorts in those other locations when we have people who want to, who are interested in either city and it's really coming down to that placement site um, and the community. So we do work with folks on that too. But it's a mutual yes, I think in all of our programs. Peace Corps is a little bit different here. So you would be looking at applying, you could perf you could choose a country pr and a program in that country that you want to apply for. We don't have all of our programming in every country. Um, so maybe you're saying, I want to do rural development in Guatemala, or I want to do aquaculture in Zambia. You would be applying to that job if it was interesting to you. Um, and then you could say that if you don't get that job, you're interested in serving elsewhere. You can then list ge geography and job sector preferences, and we will fill in, um, find a job based on your resume that's a, a good fit for you. So we want everyone to be successful. Um, that's the first tier. Second tier for us is that once you get into country, um, it, we are doing an assessment of volunteers and all of the agencies and partners that are applying for Peace Corps volunteers. And it really does become kind of a puzzle for us in terms of medical support, language skills, what are the additional skills beyond the job, what are what are the you know strengths and weaknesses, opportunities and threats at the you know the SWOT analysis of the, the the association or the agency where you'd be working. And then we try to fit people into that program um, so that it's a it's a perfect fit right for everyone to succeed. I think that what gets really kind of muddy when you think about Peace Corps is we're talking country level programs. And so when you look, at, I mean, and if, even if you're just looking at state level programs like in the United States, you know, if you're looking at Ohio, for example, you know, Northeast, Northwest, Southeast, Southwest, Central, all very different kind of, you know, cultures and opportunities and geographies and weather and climate. And so when you look at our programming, all of that is also kind of gets into some consideration. So volunteers at the top level can say, I'm really looking at a specific country. 
if you don't get that country and we offer you another one, of course, you can say, that's not what I'm interested in. Is there anything else? We try to work with you there. Once you get into your country of service, there is some vetting everything and there sometimes might be some feedback sought after from the, the volunteer, like, well, is there a part of the country that you're interested in? You don't always get that because there's just more information that, that on the backside about right fits and then skill sets and required required skills needed. And again, medical support needs that, if there are any. So it's a little bit more complicated, not as much, not as much um, input from the volunteer as maybe they would always like to think, but I, I think that more often than not, it turns out right. We have just a couple minutes left. Any final questions, Matt, Michael? Okay, and then final word from the panelists. Anything that I didn't ask about that you want to share? I'll put my email in the box if you want to reach out to me uh, and we can schedule a one-on-one -on -one, and I'm sure all of us will do the same. And I'm happy to connect you um, with any students and panelists, happy to connect you to each other. So feel free to send requests our way. I would say guys, just do it. It's, it's so valuable and can be life-changing. Just do it. I will, so I, I graduated in 2010, which was also into a recession and, um, this isn't really about service, but like, it's, it's kind of a bummer. We don't know fully what that's going to look like. So maybe things rebound in the next couple of months, but at least for grads out there right now. Um, sorry, sorry about that. But also service is, it's great, even when the economy is good, but it's real, like we have, like Carlos was saying, real positions out there that, um, you're getting really great work experience. And I think that this is a great, um, alternative, especially like during this economic time. Yeah, I just wanted to echo that as well. Similarly, I also graduated in 20, 2010 uh, and was hired on by my ministry site. Uh, couldn't get a job, you know, if I tried. Uh, I like to joke that it was the longest interview of my life, um, but I can literally point at every job I've had since my service experience and I can point back to this opportunity. Um, and yeah, similarly to what Carlos was saying also about like not thinking about it in terms of a financial burden because I feel like the trajectory of my income growth also has been substantially further along than my peers who didn't do it because jobs are like you're willing to work for free like you must be an amazing employee. So I think yes, there's all of the great things that it does in changing your heart and um, obviously working for justice and liberation for all communities, but also there's like real tangible resume benefits that are to be considered and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that. Thank you all for joining us today and spending your time. We really appreciate it.